Hello and welcome to this edition of our special series, World at War. I'm your host, Mohamed Saleh. Now, at what point should a country declare victory in a war? From the time the Russian tanks rolled into Ukraine, thousands of people have been killed. An estimated 12.8 million people have been displaced. After a relentless siege of almost about three months, Russia has now managed to capture the key port city of Mariupol. Russia started this war, which it still calls a special military operation, with the objective to demilitarize and to denazify Ukraine. So has Vladimir Putin managed to achieve these objectives? Russia's blockade of Mariupol has been relentless. These images from the 15th of May of a rain of fire hitting the Azovstal steel plant will give you a glimpse of the firepower that Russia has deployed to break the Ukrainian resistance. According to the Russian Defense Ministry, from the 16th of May, at least about 1,730 soldiers have surrendered into Russian hands from the Azovstal steel plant. Many of them are said to be from the Azov battalion. Russia has moved them to a penal colony that it controls in Donetsk. About 80 of them are said to be seriously wounded and need urgent medical attention. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has issued a statement insisting that the surrender of the soldiers holed up at Azov stall was effected only to save their lives. So what happens to these captured Ukrainian soldiers? Ukraine wants to negotiate a prisoner swap. Russia wants to put them on trial, especially the members of the Azov battalion, whom it accuses of being neo-Nazis. In Ukraine, though, a captured 21-year-old Russian tank commander, Vadim Shishimarin, has been put on trial. He's been accused of war crimes against the people of Ukraine and has pleaded guilty to killing a 62-year-old unarmed man. So three months into this war, it is now difficult to predict the direction this war will now take. The U.S. Senate has just passed a $40 billion aid bill to provide military and humanitarian assistance to Ukraine. History points out that it is much easier to start a war, but ending it is a whole different ballgame. And conflicts have a habit of acquiring a life of their own. Ukraine is the first war in which nuclear devastation has become central to history's most dangerous game. This is the game of brinkmanship. From the outset, Russia has not minced any words. On the 27th of February, just three days after its invasion, Russia announced that its nuclear forces had been put on high alert. Since then, it has invoked deadly annihilation at every turn and twist of battlefield fortunes. Listen to the statement made by President Vladimir Putin while addressing a gathering of his legislators at St. Petersburg in April. If someone intends to intervene in the ongoing events from the outside and create strategic threats for Russia that are unacceptable to us, they should know that our retaliatory strikes will be lightning fast. We have all the tools for this, things no one else can boast of having now. And we will not boast, we will use them if necessary. And if I want everyone to know that, we have made all the decisions on this matter. It is ominous when a nation with enough nuclear weapons to destroy the world several times over rattles the nuclear sabre. But there is now a sudden and also a dangerous twist in this tale. Talk of a possible nuclear confrontation has also begun to come in from Washington. This commentary in the Wall Street Journal, an influential American newspaper, states in no uncertain terms that this is an opportunity for the United States to show that it can win a nuclear war. This mainstream American newspaper claims that unless the United States is prepared to win a nuclear war, it risks losing one. The question, of course, is, is the Washington establishment ready to escalate brinkmanship to unprecedented levels? So far, the concept of MAD, an acronym for mutually assured destruction in the event of a nuclear conflict, has been sufficient as deterrence. No one has argued that there will be a victor in the horrific aftermath of a nuclear war. But the nuclear rhetoric surrounding the Ukraine war now begs a bigger question. Is there 
a new emerging nuclear doctrine in Moscow and in Washington, D.C. Let's start with Russia first. A recent paper published by the U.S. Congressional Research Service has assessed that the defunct Soviet Union had a retaliatory reciprocal counter-strike approach. This effectively meant that the Soviets had accepted a no-first-use policy but had sufficient capacity for a reciprocal retaliation. But with the disintegration of the Soviet Union in 1991, Russia rejected in gradual steps the no-first-use pledge. Paradoxically, the weaker Russia has become in conventional military capabilities, the more dependent it has become on its nuclear arsenal. From 1993 onwards, Russia revised and updated its military and national security doctrine several times. By 1997, in the wake of NATO's expansion into Eastern Europe, Russia allowed for the use of nuclear weapons in case of a threat to the existence of the Russian Federation. In 2009, the then head of Russia's Security Council, Nikolai Patrushev, said that Russia could launch preemptive nuclear strikes. In June 2020, Russia released its latest document on nuclear deterrence. It states specifically that Russia's nuclear weapons policy is defensive, but it adds a caveat. It seeks a guaranteed deterrence of a potential adversary from aggression against the Russian Federation. This means that the window for a preemptive strike to warn off a potential adversary has been left open. Western analysts describe Russia's nuclear doctrine to be a clear case of escalate to de-escalate. With the Russian war in its third month, the Western appetite for punishing Russia has also increased because the fighting is done by Ukrainians. The West gains without committing any ground troops. Weapons worth billions of dollars, such as drones, howitzer guns, javelins, stinger missiles, and even helicopters and tanks have been poured into Ukrainian hands to blunt the Russian onslaught. This is a war backed by a proxy war. So the question, of course, is, what is the official United States nuclear doctrine? A report by the Congressional Research Service, published in the month of March, states that the United States maintains calculated ambiguity and does not rule out the possibility of a preemptive strike. This American nuclear doctrine has in fact remained unchanged from the days of the Cold War. In Ukraine, the battle lines are effectively frozen. It has taken Russians more than two and a half months to take the deadliest theater of this war, Mariupol. In this scenario, the drum beats for a bigger and a more deadlier conflict have drowned out the sound of talks and negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. Since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, military analysts appear on talk shows on either side of the Atlantic and talk about the possibility of using tactical nuclear weapons. These are less powerful than strategic nuclear weapons, but still strong enough to devastate enemy targets in a specific area without causing widespread destruction and radioactive fallout. Brinkmanship does not recognize any limits. All it needs is for a hothead to make one miscalculation for matters to slip out of control. A missile armed with a nuclear warhead needs to fly for just about 300 seconds to annihilate any of the great capitals of Europe. London, Moscow, Brussels or Paris are all just one missile flight away. Brinkmanship is a game that has no winners. The military talking heads in the West and also in Russia would do well to climb off that escalation ladder and stop fantasizing about the use of tactical nuclear weapons to get a quick and easy victory. War has many dimensions. The United States of America is estimated to have been involved in at least about 32 different conflicts around the world since the end of the Second World War. But it now faces a different kind of a crisis at home, an unending civil war fueled by hate and extreme doctrines. White supremacists target black Americans, Jews, Latinos, Asian Americans, immigrants, homosexuals and atheists. 18-year-old Peyton Gendron drove for nearly about 320 kilometers from his home to Buffalo 
to open fire at random black Americans at a supermarket. This was an act of indiscriminate killing. Ten people were killed, 13 were shot, out of which 11 were said to be black. Gendron had wrecked the area carefully and had chosen this supermarket because black Americans came here to shop. This was a hate crime against black fellow Americans. Gendron, who described himself as a fascist and a white supremacist, also had written a 180-page long manifesto and had maintained an online diary, in which he recorded his meticulous planning and the reasons why he'd resorted to mass murder. The one idea that Peyton Gendron repeatedly referred to is the Great Replacement Theory. This is a fringe idea that has acquired greater currency off late. Dr. Lawrence Rosenthal, who is a lead researcher at the Berkeley Center for Right-Wing Studies, tells us what this theory is all about. Replacement theory is the idea that or white populations, both in North America, here in, in the USA, and in Europe, are being replaced by minority populations, largely through immigration. The Great Replacement Theory is said to have its roots in early 20th century French nationalism. It was popularized by French novelist and conspiracy theorist Renaud Camus, who believed that immigration from Africa and West Asia would eventually lead to the extinction of the pure white race in Europe. This was the theme of the Charlottesville rally in the United States of America in 2017 by white supremacists. They had two really notable chants. Uh, one was, you will not replace us. So it's clear by 2017 that in the extreme American right, um, that replacement theory was an understood concept, an understood and broadly accepted concept, something explaining their sense of dispossession in, in the USA owing to um, the presence of minorities and, and the quote-unquote threat of immigration. Tucker Carlson, who happens to be one of America's most popular television anchors, has referred to the Great Replacement Theory at least 400 times in his shows in the last five years. President Biden has described white supremacy to be a poison that is polluting America. What happened here is simple and straightforward. Terrorism. Terrorism. Domestic terrorism. Violence inflicted in the service of hate and the vicious thirst for power that defines one group of people being inherently inferior to any other group. Peyton Gendron's terror attack has yet again highlighted the problem of the chronic gun culture in the United States. There are some really disturbing questions which the American authorities will have to answer. Just last year, Gendron had spent a day and a half at a hospital undergoing a mental health examination after writing that he wanted to commit murder or suicide in a high school project. With this being the case, why were there no red flags? The Gendron massacre is a part of a disturbing pattern in the United States. Driven by hate and xenophobia, gunmen in the United States have targeted specific ethnic communities. In 2018, for instance, 46-year-old Robert Bowers had opened fire at a synagogue in Pittsburgh, killing 11 people and wounding six others. This is the deadliest attack ever on the Jewish community in the United States. In 2019, 21-year-old Patrick Hood had opened fire at a Walmart superstore in El Paso in Texas. 23 people were killed in an attack that specifically targeted the Latino community. In 2021, 21-year-old Robert Aaron Long went on a shooting spree at three different spas in Atlanta, killing eight people six of whom were Asian women. This climate of hatred is consuming America from the inside. And unless this hate is confronted with and dealt with head on,
the American society will end up more divided than ever before. Finland and Sweden joining the NATO military alliance will overnight double the border that NATO has with Russia. The Russians, of course, have hit back. The Russians have said that there will be no more talk of a nuclear-free Baltics if Finland and Sweden give up their neutrality. Now, in this context, how are the three tiny nations of Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia that make up the Baltic nations looking at these Russian threats? To help us understand this better, we are joined by the Foreign Minister of Estonia, Eva Maria Lime. Minister Lime, thank you very much indeed for taking time out and speaking to us here on Vion. This, I'm sure, is a question that a lot of people have been asking you as to how the three tiny Baltic nations, and especially Estonia, are looking at the threats that are being given by the Russians that there will be no more talk of a nuclear-free Baltics. Here, of course, uh, we very much hope that all these uh, international treaties that uh, we have to avoid uh, nuclear threat uh, globally um, uh, will uh, prevent any uh, nuclear attack. And of course, uh, this kind of uh, threatening rhetoric is uh, unacceptable. Uh, we very much look forward to, uh, 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 to uh, Finland and uh, Sweden joining NATO because it's, uh, it definitely will increase the uh, security. Now, Minister Lime, are you disappointed in the manner in which the Western nations, especially the bigger powers of the NATO military alliance, such as the United States, and others have responded to Russia's aggression, especially when in the initial few days of war, these nations were seen to be dragging their feet in countering Russia's aggression. Most of all, of course, we have been very much disappointed in Russia's actions because Russia is the one who started this unjustified and unprovoked war in Ukraine. Uh, Russia is uh, violating international law, Russia is violating UN Charter and also is uh, violating core principles of the European security architecture. To respond to these uh, violations, we have seen very strong uh, united approach by all uh, like-minded democratic countries. Either they are members of the European Union or they are members of uh, NATO or they are just uh, strong democracies and they support Ukraine in this uh, very uh, unacceptable war uh, which takes place at the moment in Ukraine. Now, if Russia manages to get its way in Ukraine, do you think the security of the Baltic states could also in some ways be threatened? Estonia, together with other Baltic states, uh, we are member of uh, NATO and the EU since 2004, and we clearly see that uh, our security, like uh, the uh, security of other European countries in NATO, is granted by uh, uh, Article 5 and collective defence. So, therefore, we don't see direct military threat to our countries uh, at the moment. But what we clearly see is that uh, the security environment in Europe is changed because uh, none of the uh, previous um, agreements uh, um, apply as we have seen that Russia has violated them. Therefore, of course, we think that uh, uh, it is important to strengthen our uh, collective uh, defence and our defence uh, uh, posture because of this uh, change in security environment in Europe. Minister Lemay, thank you very much indeed for taking time out and sharing all those insights here with us on Vion. Thank you very much for having me. In societies where religious extremists can set the political agenda, accusations of blasphemy and street justice keep surfacing with distressing regularity. Blasphemy is a sensitive topic for the self-appointed guardians of faith. Our next story is from Nigeria, where a young Christian college student was beaten to death by a mob that included her own classmates on the mere allegation that she had blasphemed. Nigeria is Africa's most populous nation. It is religiously diverse, with 53% of its population being Muslim, while 46% of the population is Christian. In recent years, religious intolerance engineered by Muslim hotheads is on the rise in Nigeria. In the latest incident to have shocked the world, a second-year college student identified as Deborah Samuel Yakubu was stoned and beaten to death by a mob that included her own classmates. 
Her body was later set on fire. The incident took place at the Shehu Shagari School in Sokoto in northwestern Nigeria. Videos that are doing the rounds on social media show the attackers holding up a matchbox and celebrating the killing of the college student. Deborah Samuel Yakubu, a Christian student, was accused of blasphemy in her posts on social media. The authorities have now shut down the school. It all started with, within a WhatsApp group and uh, things um, escalated uh, because uh, many, uh, many of the students assumed or uh, were a bit offended by the comments by Deborah for uh, you know, accusing them or blaming them for spreading their religious beliefs. An investigation has been ordered. Two of the attackers identified from the videos have been apprehended. But this has sparked protests against police action. Hundreds of people took to the streets and demanded that the detained attackers be released. Despite the heavy police presence, the protesters besieged the palace of Muhammad Saad Abu Bakr, the Sultan of Sokoto and the highest spiritual figure among Muslims in Nigeria, who had condemned the killing and had demanded for justice. But this is not the first time that Nigeria has been rocked by violence due to alleged blasphemy. In 2002, about 100 people had died in protests against the Miss World pageant. In 2006, there were riots in Nigeria over the publication of cartoons of Prophet Muhammad in a Danish magazine. In 2009, there was violence in the Jigawa state over distribution of blasphemous pamphlets. In 2020, a 22-year-old musician was sentenced to death for committing blasphemy in his songs. These are to state just a few incidents among many. Often allegations of blasphemy result in street violence in Nigeria. And the gruesome killing of Deborah Samuel Zakubu is the latest in the long list of violent incidents sparked by allegations of blasphemy. Bureau Report, We On, World Is One. It is impossible to understand the horror and misery of getting caught in the line of heavy fire of sophisticated artillery bombardment from the comfort of a living room. Escape is often the only option for innocent civilians. And yet, this is a story of a bunch of zookeepers from Michael Eve who have chosen not to abandon their animals and wait it out for the war to end. When you think of a war zone, this is not what comes to mind. Tigers, polar bears, giraffes and elephants, but they too can be trapped by war. The Mykolaiv Zoo was established over 120 years ago, till some weeks back it was a major draw for children and families. But now only the animals and the zookeepers remain. It is scary, very scary. I'm scared for myself, my children and grandchildren. One can't describe it. Well, you won't leave animals behind and we can't leave either. If we all leave, then who will look after them and take care of them? We grew up with them. I am myself a rural girl. I grew up and will not betray them. Whatever will happen to us will happen. Perhaps the war will go on. Perhaps the war will go away. The Sioux has been hit by several stray Russian mortar shells. The constant boom of explosives has frightened the animals and turned them restless. Most residents of the city have fled, but these animals have nowhere to go. If abandoned, they would die of hunger. Food supplies are running short. And the zookeepers have no idea for how long they will be able to look after them. They are with us practically all the time. They do not understand what is happening. We are next to them all the time and they are with us. They stay on the second floor in our armchairs. 
We are constantly near them. We carry them all the time. We love them. Nyushenka has been here since she was a kitten. Ostapik was also small when he came here. For that reason, we do not call him Ostap. We called him Ostapik, pet name usually used for a child, because he was just tiny. Mikolaev is a key stepping stone for Russian forces on their way towards Odessa. It has witnessed several waves of heavy fighting. So far, the Ukrainians have managed to fend off the Russian attacks. All able-bodied men in the age group of 18 to 60 have been barred from leaving. But women and children have the option to move to a safer place. The zookeepers, though, are staying put. They don't expect to come under direct attack. But a stray shell has an arbitrary destination. It could mean the difference between life and death. Bureau Report, we on World is One. Truth has a way of coming out, even if it is a couple of decades late. George W. Bush invaded into Afghanistan in 2001 to fight his war in terror. He then followed this up by invading into Iraq in 2003 on the pretext of finding weapons of mass destruction. The alleged WMDs were never found, but almost 20 years later, George W. Bush, recently while addressing an event at Texas, made a gaffe. In contrast, Russian elections are rigged. Political opponents are imprisoned or otherwise eliminated from participating in the electoral process. The result is an absence of checks and balances in Russia and the decision of one man to launch a wholly unjustified and brutal invasion of Iraq. I mean, of Ukraine. <laughs> Iraq, too. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> 75. Uh. <laughs> Others dub this to be a rare Freudian slip, that accidental error that reveals the real subconscious thoughts and feelings. We wrap the show up with this rather clear, albeit an unintended admission, by George W. Bush. I'm your host, Mohammed Saleh. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.